Shabbat Shalom. On Sunday, December 7th, 1987, the largest Jewish rally ever held in Washington, D.C., gathered in the National Mall. Some estimated that 250,000 participants came together that day to protest for the release of Soviet Jews. Natan Sharansky, perhaps the most famous Jewish Soviet dissident, had just been released recently, and he spoke at that rally. That was the largest rally ever held on the National Mall until this past Tuesday. On Tuesday, nearly 300,000 people gathered at the National Mall to stand with Israel in its defense against Hamas terrorism and to demand the release of over 230 hostages. An equal number of people watched the event live streamed. Among the estimated 290,000 participants attending the rally were approximately 300 people from Houston. And about 80 of those 300... <laughs> And about 80 of those 300 were young adults and teens from our religious schools, day schools, and colleges. <laughs> Rabbi Strauss, Rabbi Ford, our President Lori Herzog, and I were among the Houston delegation. It was an inspiring and uplifting experience for everyone who attended, and a reassuring sign of solidarity among the Jewish people across a wide spectrum of political, ideological, and denominational affiliations. And incredibly, among the speakers was once again Natan Sharansky, the Jewish Soviet dissident of 36 years ago. Among the other speakers were leaders of both parties in the House and the Senate, family members of a few of the hostages, and some celebrities. The program lasted for four hours. And here's another fun fact. One of the organizers of the Soviet Jewry rally was one of our members, Dennis Bram. He was the vice chair of the National Conference on Soviet Jewry at the time. And his wife, Sarah, attended one of the planning meetings at which she suggested the name for the rally, Freedom Sunday, and that's the name they used. And Dennis was also with us at the rally on Tuesday. Now, I had been up since 4 o'clock in the morning to catch a plane at 6.30, along with the, our rabbis here and Lori and a couple of dozen other members of the Houston delegation. And when we arrived at D.C., we took the metro to the mall and stood waiting in the crush of people to get through security and there was a lot of security. And then we stood during the entire program, four hours, but it was well worth it. Afterward, we took the Metro back to the airport and flew home the same evening, a whirlwind of a trip. On the flight back, I happened to sit in a row with one of our Kahila High School students, Ariel Jacobson, and she is actually going to be speaking about her experience at the rally next Friday night. So stay tuned. And she will be joined by one of our college students, Sophie Kalman. I wanted to especially mention Dennis Bram and the demonstration for Soviet Jewry 36 years ago, as well as our students who attended the rally on Tuesday, because our theme for this evening is Lador Vador, from generation to generation. In the Passover Haggadah, there's a passage that reminds us that Shalom echad bilvad amar aleinu v'chalotenu, ela shebechol dor vador, odim aleinu l'chalotenu. That is, not just during our slavery in Egypt, but in every generation, there are those who arise to seek our destruction. But in every generation, the Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, watches over us to ensure our survival. And so, as the Haggadah also teaches us, Bechol dor vador chayav adam lirot et atzmo ke'ilu ha hu yatsami mitzrayim. In every generation, each one of us must see ourselves as if we had personally left slavery behind in Egypt. Each of us should personally feel redeemed 
from danger and oppression. 36 years ago, a generation ago, we demonstrated for the release of Soviet Jews, and we were successful. On Tuesday, we demonstrated in solidarity with our brothers and sisters and cousins in Israel, whether by blood or by the mere fact that we identify as Jews. We made a strong statement, a statement that one can visually see in the photos of the event in which the entire mall was filled with people. It was a statement that we stand with them. We support their effort to root out Hamas from power in Gaza. We support their determination to free the captives held by this terrorist organization. And we show our support for Israel in this difficult time when so many others are demonstrating against the only Jewish state in the world. And our message was certainly felt in Congress with leaders of both parties supporting this cause. No country on this earth would allow such an extremist terrorist regime to exist on its border with the atrocities that Hamas committed on October 7th. And no country on earth would rest when over 230 of its citizens were being held captive. As I mentioned in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, one of the Hamas leaders actually boasted on Arab TV station that Hamas would continue to perpetrate atrocities like October 7th over and over again until Israel ceases to exist. Israel has no choice but to remove Hamas from power in Gaza. It cannot allow its citizens to be terrorized like that. Who would want to live in the villages that Hamas attacked until Hamas is no longer a threat? From generation to generation, we must always be ready to defend our right to live in peace and security according to our customs and traditions. I'm so happy that we had 80 teens and young adults participate in this march because they represent the next generation. But in addition to the March on Solidarity with Israel, Rabbi Strauss and Fort and I have also been speaking here in Houston about the war to our students in our schools and to others in the city of Houston. For instance, Rabbi Strauss is going to appear on Channel 2 this Sunday morning at 10 a.m., so stay tuned. Rabbi Fort spoke to the students in our religious school from grades three and up. And I spoke at St. John's Upper School this last Friday. About 60 students attended the program that I spoke at. I spoke about the conflict, the history of Gaza, the nature of Hamas and its attack on Israel, and I addressed questions the students had about slogans they were hearing from anti-Israel demonstrations. The program was organized by the Jewish Affinity Group at St. John's, and these students, too, will be our next generation. I also participated in an African-American pastors program on Wednesday. That program was organized by the Israeli consulate and included three relatives of hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. Their stories were painful to hear but compelling. The pastors offered prayers and committed to passing along these stories to the many churches at which they preach. We are not alone. But all of us can do something to show our support for Israel. Continue to be in touch with the people you know in Israel. It is important for them to know that we are always with them in spirit. Continue to write our representatives in Congress. They hear a lot from those who are opposed to Israel's efforts to eliminate Hamas. They need to hear from us as well. And I imagine I don't need to say, but I will anyway, keep reading about what is going on from many sources of information. The media is frequently biased and sometimes simply uninformed. Reading from a variety of sources can give us a broader perspective. Be careful about the terminology that is sometimes used in the media. Things like war crimes, disproportionate use of force, or white colonialist settlers. If you haven't heard Rabbi Fort's sermon on this last term, watch it on YouTube. The term war crimes has a very specific legal definition. Most journalists use the term without knowing what it actually means. But several lawyers who specialize in the laws of war have not labeled Israel's military tactics as war crimes. In fact, they have said it appears that Israel is following the laws of war. 
I'd be happy to share with you any articles on this complicated subject. The disproportionate use of force does not simply mean counting the number of casualties on both sides and seeing who's losing. This too is often completely misunderstood and is in fact another specific matter in the laws of war. I often hear or read journalists say that Israel has indiscriminately targeted civilians or hospitals. This is simply not true. Israel is taking extraordinary precautions to avoid civil civilian casualties and to avoid destroying hospitals. That's why the hospitals are still standing. But Hamas fighters intentionally hide behind or among civilians, forcing Israel to risk civilian lives in order to kill the fighters. Hamas, as we know, used the hospital basements as bases for their operations, forcing Israel to engage in combat around the hospitals in order to gain access to Hamas's weapons and military centers. These are all legitimate targets of war. And certainly they do not reflect Israel targeting civilians or hospitals. They're targeting Hamas. Genocide is another term we hear frequently. Genocide is defined as the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. So far, Hamas sources say that 11,000 Gazans have been killed, but they do not specify how many of them were actually Hamas fighters. And I want to be clear that I feel horrible, personally, about however many innocent civilians were killed. But in a population of 2.4 million, it is actually a distortion of language to call it a genocide. War is always horrible. Israel did not ask for this war. Hamas intentionally forced Israel into it. The point I'm trying to make is that we unfortunately need to prepare ourselves to answer questions or respond to false statements or abuses of language, particularly when we write letters to the editor or our representatives. Most of us probably do not want to engage in arguments with friends or coworkers, and I'm not suggesting that we necessarily should, but we can at least know for ourselves how to interpret what is actually going on. For more information on all these matters, I highly recommend the AJC, ADL, Honest Reporting, and our own Federation websites. Finally, we can continue to donate money to organizations to Israel, the Friends of IDF, United Hatzalah, the Federation, or our own Masorti movement. Now, if you would like a written copy of this sermon, because I just gave you a whole lot of information, just email me, and I will send you a written copy. It has links to all these places and resources. In every generation, each one of us must see ourselves as if we have personally left slavery behind in Egypt. In every generation, we have faced some kind of adversity, but we are a positive and optimistic people. We gave the world the very idea of a messianic time in which everyone will live in peace and harmony. We firmly believe that this too shall pass. And we also believe that it is in some ways our responsibility to help make that dream a reality. Lador Vador, from generation to generation, Am Yisrael Chai. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>